Some nice South Texas habitat. You get your uh, acacia, rigidulas, and then you got the uh, ebony, which I'm not familiar with at all. Also has pinnate leaves. You got the, some nice lafafra, some nice mames. Whole ground is alive with cryptogamma crust. And uh, of course, more Nostoc cyanobacteria. Got a Hatropha dioica. Got the invasive uh, buffalo grass everywhere. What is this? This oh, this is at the, I think it's a Yakum. Zygophilaceae, Leucophyllum patessens, Carwinskia, lots of Ramnasia here, lots. Condalia, Condalia hookeri, and uh, Spathalata. Then you got some nice, uh, kind of serious Iniacanthus. No idea what prickly pear this is, but it's got some mean glockens. Look at those. one just to confuse you more used to be in Fabaceae is not anymore now supposedly in its own family ebony ebonopsis ebono sure looks like a Fabaceae though huh? I can't tell it's apart from acacia rigidulia yet because I just became familiar with it god legumes one day one day I'll get into them well, not anytime soon but one day This is the same blue lichen we've seen. Uh, God, there's so many different species here. Someone's got to study this. It's the same blue lichen we saw yesterday. The astrophytum spot. But you can just see how this cryptogamic crust just holds the soil together. It's pretty wild. There's got to be a dozen species there at least. Because this is all just sand, but it's held together so tightly by everything. All this material. And there's a little bit of moss too. This tiny stuff. No idea what species. At least I think that's a moss. Could be a. It's got to be a moss. Yeah. Wild. Anyway, it just looks like you're in a stand of, uh, you know, some nice look of phylum. And you look a little bit closer, and hiding in there is a, a very, very odd one. A kind of serious Poselgarii, or Poselgarii, however you say it. Named after some uh, dead white guy. Regardless, uh, what a weird cactus, and what nice camouflage. Big pink flowers when it blooms. I don't know how this is an kind of serious, don't ask me. But, somehow, it is. Where's it going to the ground? Let's see. Oh, Christ. I can't even see it. Here. Here's the stem. <laughs> Covered in lichen. Oh, wow. That is weird. It's got, it's got like a very woody stem, too. Jesus. A weird plant. <laughs> The next stage in cacti evolution to deal with the uh, anthropogenic threat of I can't even find it now I lost it I walk right by it to deal with the anthropogenic threat of, uh, of poaching they just camouflage they're gonna start losing spines just relying on camouflage <laughs> here's another one right there this stem Let's around here through this and then right there It's a big one. It kind of serious Poselgare. Oh, it looks like it's got a little bud emerging. It's probably blooming a month or two. Yeah, who needs spines, eh? Spines are old news. It's like an old model. Now you gotta hide. So Homo sapiens can't see you. Except for those couple days when you bloom once a year. Anyway, another nice piece of this habitat. And important for uh, very important for pollinators is Gugnadia hypoluca. And why I find this so interesting is that uh, you got those bilabia or pseudo bilabia corollas just like Trixus. It's one of those basal asters. It's uh, 
Uticiae, which means it doesn't it doesn't share that uh, twenty-two thousand kilo or twenty-two kilobase pair, so that's twenty thousand twenty-two thousand base pair inversion that the rest of Asteraceae shares. You know? Barnadesia and Muticia uh, subfamilies do not have that that uh, that inversion and uh, I it's in the ribosome. I forget what part of the gene it's in, but anyway, twenty two thousand base pair inversion, they flipped. And this does not have it. Nor do any other plant families, any other angiosperms have that. Only the asters, except for the subfamily that this is in and uh you know, all the other genera that are in those two subfamilies. Mutici and Barnadesia, real nice, real beautiful subfamilies. A lot of uh, diversity in South America. Another nice thing about this is that some people, some people think it smells like ash. I don't, I don't think so. It smells a little bit musky, but I kind of like it. Maybe it's just the pervert in me. I don't know. But uh, also, it's got Hypoluca is the species name, uh, probably because it's got these silver undersides, those beautiful silver undersides. I'm gonna grow this. I'm gonna get some of these and grow them. Nice invasive honeybee. And again, just pebble plains, old limestone, eroded, crumbling. Oh, wow, there's some loafs right there. Nice echinocactus uh, texensis right there. And then, of course, just loafs growing white out. White out exposed. Not under the cover of mesquite. Pretty nice. It's pretty nice. You could say it's nice. You could say that. You could say it's nice. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. They're thriving. Look at that. So nice how they just recess into the mud. And again, it's not sand, it's like a clay. It's like a very thick, wet clay. Yeah, it's about an 18 inch long clump of loafs growing under mesquite. I wonder if they just if they photosynthesize in the winter when the mesquite drops its leaves and then. They photosynthesize most, mostly, photosynthesize mostly in the winter when the mesquite drops its leaves and then kind of go dormant in the hot summer. And then of course they'd be in the shade too anyway. What disperses the seed though? Rodents? I mean the fruits just look like little pink chili peppers. This 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 is really common in cultivation. It's it's really easy to grow. Uh, the seeds look like little black poppy seeds, but uh, I mean most cacti are relatively easy to germinate. But uh, to see it, you know, in its ecology that it occurs in is is pretty wild. You know, like I had no idea it grows with this nostoc, that cyanobacteria, that biofilm, the photosynthetic bacteria. I had no idea the soil type was this this thick clay. You know, because whenever you see them in cultivation, they're almost always grown in really fast draining uh, cactus mix, which is not what this is. This is not fast draining. Um, there's a big clump at the Berkeley Botanic Garden that 
It's riddled with mites. It's not doing that well, but it was, you know, confiscated. I think Fish and Wildlife or DEA or someone gave it to them, uh, you know, for educational and science purposes to preserve. And it looks nothing like this, so it's it's just cool to see this stuff thriving. And it's a, a habitat it's evolved with, which is, again, it's it's wild. And it's always growing under the canopy. Not always. I mean, you saw back there, there were a few that were just on open... Uh, open limestone hills no cover at all but here it's just so ubiquitous it's almost like a weed and then of course it's got the ability to just recess into the mud like that too it's just so cool how this sort of situation evolves and how it comes up and how i guess just how evolution works it's just another fantastic example of uh, of how wonderful life on planet Earth is. <laughs> if you if you grant me that sentiment, don't want to sound like too much of a sap. Still got a lot of negativity and cynicism left, but none of it directed at nature. Well, just mostly people. Another beautiful Echinoceris poselgrai, and then what looks to be like a almost coalescent peyote. It's weird. God, I love this Echinoceris. Look at that. Oh, what I give to see these blooming. Oh, wow. Nice massive colony of Echinoceris and the Acanthus. Look at it. Oof. Grow beneath a large mesquite. And of course, you got another basal aster, Accordia nana. Look at those leaves. Jesus. Beautiful when they flower, man. All the Accordias are really pretty when they bloom.